so today we will have a second lecture in the in the series of uh, summary lectures and this lecture will be devoted to the accretion onto neutron stars and uh, galactic uh, black uh, holes the last lecture will be on on agn in february as i told you so uh, we observe those sources mostly in x-rays so i would like to to remind you again a few things about x-ray uh, astronomy there was short uh, outline on this topic in lecture one or or two but uh, nevertheless uh, i will call your attention to a few other things so of course to do x-ray astronomy we need uh, satellites because the atmosphere is uh, not transparent in, in x-rays so you have to be well above the uh, earth's atmosphere at a height of a few hundred uh, kilometers to avoid the, the absorption of all x-rays through the uh, atmosphere uh, nevertheless, there is still a problem of, of uh, absorption because uh, X-ray sources are absorbed by uh, hydrogen in our galaxy and then we cannot, of course, go beyond the galaxy to observe. So this is one of the, of the problems in X-ray astronomy, but this is un unsolvable. So in, in X-rays, uh, first few sources were named like Cygnus X1, so the first source detected in constellation uh, Cygnus, and this constellation is uh, seen in our uh, part of the, of the sky in Poland. Uh, Cygnus is, is well uh, seen. Here is the constellation. This is the, the location of Cygnus X1. Some other sources and many are still recognized as for you and then coordinates. This is for Uhuru catalog. So this is the, how the astronomy, X-ray astronomy developed. And I mentioned to you before that Ricardo Giacconi uh, Nobel Prize winner in 2002 was one of the key uh, persons who, who pursued the, the, the development of, of uh, satellites. So first discovery, uh, discoveries were made uh, using uh, military satellites. Actually, the discovery of X-ray emission from Sun was done using rocket V2, which has pretty bad connotation after the Second World War, but this this was the first probably the scientific use of this uh, thing. Then the, the, the rocket Adobe uh, allowed uh, Ricardo Giacconi to determine, to, to discover the first extrasolar source, Corpus X1. And discovery of, of uh, X-ray source was not uh, simple to, 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 to pursue for the physics, nature of the source, etc. Uh, before uh, we had an optical identification, because as, as usual, the optical identification gives you the star type, in this case, the companion star, the distance, everything you would like to know about the source. So optical identification done by Sandage was really crucial. Soon after, there was first X-ray Nova detected. We'll talk more about X-ray Nova uh, soon. Then the same year, there was discovery of radio pulsars. Of course, this is not X-ray astronomy, but discovery of radio pulsars clearly showed that uh, hypothetical uh, neutron stars do exist. Right, so that solved the, the theoretical problem. Pulsars must have been neutron stars because at no, no other star would be able to rotate that fast. And then in 19, 1970, there was the first 
Uhuru, the first astronomical satellite launched named Uhuru. And this was really the beginning of systematic X-ray uh, astronomy. So the final, so that, that uh, satellite worked for a couple of years and the final catalog for Uhuru catalog contained already over 300 uh, objects detected covering the whole sky in two to six kV band. And still many of the popular sources uh, had this, this catalog name, like 3C to 73 is the reminder of the, of the third Cambridge catalog. So shortly after the launch of Uhuru, it became quite clear that X-ray emission is powered by, by accretion onto a neutron star or a black hole. And uh, sources are basically of, of binary nature. And then, as, as you know, this, those theoretical papers uh, followed soon after Shakura 72, Shakura and Sumyaev. 73 and this really established the, the field of accretion disk theory. So this, this development, this evolution was really very, very rapid in this period. Then there were more satellites and more knowledge, but the Progress is probably not as fast as you would like to have. So there was Einstein telescope first, which brought high resolution X-ray spectra. Then Exosat allowed to detect the, the uh, variability in, in AGN. Rosat was very important satellite because that provided an old sky survey and the Rosat catalog contains over one, 150,000 uh, sources. And this is the only available old sky survey nowadays. So for, for example, if, I, if I'm interested in X-ray emission of any of the quasars <coughs> I study in the optical band, if there was no devoted observation in X-rays of this source, I still have to go to Rosat catalog to get the upper limit. There is nothing else to do it. So now there are two satellites, Chandra and XNM Newton, launched already 20 years ago, over 20 years ago, but still active. And they are kind of complementary. XNM Newton has larger detection, detector area, so it can uh, detect fainter objects. On the other hand, Chandra has very high spatial and spectral resolution. So here, for example, you have an image from Rosat of uh, galaxy cluster Abel 2256. And this is the same cluster as seen by Chandra, right? The number of details here is really impressive. So imaging was really a very strong uh, achievement of, of, of Chandra. And now we have a, a, a number of smaller specialized satellites which bring additional uh, data. But the next major step is, observed, is expected to be done by, by Athena satellite. But this, this is for you, this is not for me. I will retire before this thing is launched. So Oftagelder, according to his arc, uh, archive, by the way, if you need anything about X-ray astronomy, you should go there to this archive. We have about 1 million sources, individual sources in X-rays. So of course it still looks quite poor in comparison with optical band where we have 1 billion of sources, right? 10 to nine. This is just Gaia catalog, recent catalog. So for, for majority of quasars, we have uh, no information 
about their X-ray emission. But in this uh, lecture, we will concentrate on X-ray binaries, as I mentioned at the, at the beginning. And we know about 200 uh, X-ray binaries in our galaxy and several, I don't know the exact number, uh, many sources in, in, in nearby galaxies, but only nearby galaxies because those sources are too faint to be discovered at large uh, distances, large redshifts, of course. So we don't have that many sources, but we have very complicated classification. I will talk only about the, the basic classification, but there are many additional sub 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 classes, whatever. So first division is done uh, according to the mass of the companion of the donor star. So we have high mass X-ray binaries and low mass X-ray binaries. In the high mass X-ray binaries, the, the companion is a large star, massive star, main sequence or a bit evolved star. Of, of, if, if main sequence, then it's O or B or B, B is magnetic uh, star. And of course, the accreting star is a neutron star or a black uh, hole. The accretion goes through the wind, so the, the division is not just formal, but it has additional consequences. The accretion is from the wind because those massive stars, they have strong winds, so they do not need to feel the rush low before the, the accretion starts. The formation is, is relatively well known and there was a considerable mass exchange before, uh, because you had to form the neutron star or this black hole mass. So you had to, to uh, uh, went through the supernova uh, evolutionary period episode to get this kind of things. And the evolution of massive stars is fast. So those uh, stars uh, are young stars and they formally belong to population Y stars. And in the optical <coughs> band, because the companion is very bright, we see mostly companions. So we don't get much from observations in the optical band in those systems. And of course, the most famous example of those systems is uh, Signal 6 1. If we are interested in studying accretion disks, then low mass X ray binaries are actually more interesting and important. In low mass uh, uh, binaries, the companion is a low mass, uh, usually main sequence uh, star. So the companion star is less bright, and in the optical band you see the, 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 the accretion disk. So you can you can know what the accretion disk is, is, is doing. Then because the, the mass is, is, is low, the evolution is, is long, and uh, sources belong to all population, population two stars. Then the, the primary, the, 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 the second, the donor star does not have strong wind because low mass stars do not have strong winds. So then they have to evolve to feel the Roche lobe and then the accretion proceeds through the Roche lobe through this inner Lagrange point. So you, you know exactly the angular momentum of, 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 of the material. So from theoretical point of view, those sources are much more attractive for studying the, the formation and evolution of an accretion disk. And an example of things is X-ray, is, is Nova Musca, for example. So this is, uh, those are artistic figures, of course, this is not a real thing. 
And in the case of high mass X-ray binary, you see the, the, the compact star. It can have a jet, it does not have always a jet and the disk. And this the star is, is pretty large, early type star. And the, the wind is, uh, well, sometimes sort of focused wind, right? Like in Cygnus X1, but it's not a stream like in uh, uh, low mass X-ray binaries. This is a very interesting uh, system which uh, belongs to low mass X-ray binaries, but this is really, really extreme. The orbital period in this system is only 11 minutes. The source, as you, as you see from the name, was discovered many years ago already by Uhuru satellite. So to explain this very short period, as a donor star in that case, you need not a main sequence, small main sequence star, but actually a wide dwarf. But otherwise, this is perfectly representative uh, case. Only it's really very small. Here you see a fragment of the of the sun surface. Just for illustration, this is a, a kind of a flare in the in the solar corona, and this is Earth, right? It's not much much larger than that. This is the most compact system. But otherwise, it's representative. It has this stream which hits the outer disk. So it looks like cataclysmic variables, actually. Only in cataclysmic variables, you have here large star, which is a white dwarf. But here you have a neutron star or a black hole. In this system, we have no. So the second uh, classification goes uh, according to the uh, accreting star. And we divide uh, the sources independently from previous <coughs> division. It's just different dimension. Uh, we divide systems into neutron stars and uh, black holes. So in the case of, of uh, black holes, we have a very interesting phenomenon of this X-ray novi, and we will talk about it uh, more. But classification is much more complex in the case of neutron star, because then you additionally have a magnetic field of the neutron star. And as it was in the case of cataclysmic variables, everything depends on the strength of the magnetic field. So the classification is sort of similar. But it was introduced observationally, so it seems uh, apparently un, uh, unrelated, uh, but it's the same thing. So very, very well known uh, sources are so-called Z sources. So those sources have uh, intermediate uh, magnetic fields. So they would correspond to intermediate uh, polars. In those Z sources, the accretion disk does not touch the star. And the, those, those Z sources are usually low mass X-ray binaries. Why Z sources? The name is purely observational. So in astronomy, we draw very frequently so-called uh, color color diagram, diagrams. And in this case, of course, uh, colors are defined in, in X-ray bands. So soft color is defined as four to, to six, and then to this in KV, and hard color is this to that. It's not very, very typical definition, but there are different definitions done. And the source, individual source, again, you see pretty old source for you, whatever the number. During the evolution, they perform this kind of thing, which looks like Z, Zorro, right? And uh, this is the, the reason for, for the name of this class of uh, 
And this so. kind of uh, configuration is shown in every neutron scan, or the diagram is like for the evolution of. This is time evolution of a single neutron star so, system. Yeah. It seems kind of similar to NOVA, yeah. X-ray NOVA, yeah. but it's not quite complete. So I, I, honestly, I'm not sure if this is really related or not, because I think uh, this is less spectacular and more chaotic because of the magnetic field. So I don't think it was really carefully modeled. I don't, I, I wouldn't, uh, firmly comment on, on, on the nature of, the, of this evolution, why it, it and, goes uh, this way. And what is the highest magnetic field still now observed for a neutron star in binary? Like, I, I mean, most of the time I can't... For X-ray pulsars, this is kind of, of standard yeah. or moderate 10 to 12, and but the, you have those extreme uh, magnetars, <laughs> right? Yeah, and, then, and then it's it's 10 to 15 or so, but, but then this, this is not uh, binary. Yeah, so is there any like an evolutionary connection that this man that doesn't exist in binary? I don't know, good, good question, good question. I'm not working in this field, so I do not always follow uh -huh. all the uh, newest evolution, but I, I, I would suspect that a, a number of those points do not really have a firm answer to uh -huh. that. So still a higher magnetic field of, uh, as in, in uh, radio pulsars, 10 to 12 are met in X-ray pulsars and standard X-ray pulsars are not seen in low mass X-ray binaries. So standard X-ray pulsar looks more or less like that. Of course, this is again uh, artistic uh, picture. So here it seems like we have still the remnants of, of an equation based on the other hand, if the magnetic field is strong, perhaps we don't have the, 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 the equation disk uh, at all, but anyway, most of the, of the X-ray emission comes from the, from the pulsar. The, the estimates of the magnetic field are done usually if possible, by studying the, the absorption lines in, in, in the spectrum of the neutron star, if you can uh, detect the, the cyclotron lines, then, then you can estimate the, the magnetic uh, field. So the accretion actually should proceed through the accretion column, but this is not, so it should be connected somehow like this. It, the interesting uh, thing in X-ray pulsars is that <coughs> sometimes they are active and sometimes they switch off. And this is still under uh, discussion what is actually happening, whether accretion is stopped uh, or sometimes uh, people talk about uh, propeller state. So the magnetic uh, field becomes uh, stronger, I don't know why it should become stronger, or the, the accretion rate is, is fainter, weaker, and then the magnetosphere, instead of allowing for the inflow, just causes the ejection of the material along the open uh, magnetic field line. But so, some people question this, this issue. So the, the, the problem of the propeller uh, state existence or not existence of propeller state is uh, still an open question. Similar thing is under discussion in uh, symbiotic stars actually. So this propeller state uh, is a generic problem, not, not only in X-ray. Binaries. And then finally, we have a special uh, subclass in uh, only in low mass X ray binaries, and those <coughs> are millisecond pulsars. 
those millisecond pulsars are uh, interesting for uh, because of several uh, reasons. So first, such so those those sources millisecond pulsars are sometimes seen in radios and undetected in X-rays, but. Uh, in many cases, they are seen in, in X-rays. The first example with the period of uh, one millisecond without clear detection of the companion was also seen in, it was detected in 1982. And the, the puzzle was that it had very weak magnetic field. Normally, uh, when pulsars are born, young pulsars have fast rotation and strong magnetic field <coughs> and then uh, the magnetic field is uh, the, the, and the rotational energy is lost by emission <coughs> and with age the pulsar slows down and the magnetic field decays because the rotation goes down so the magnetic field is also not, so, uh, not, not supported. And finally, normal radio pulsars, they end up their evolution in so-called graveyard. They stop to be active pulsars. That's the end of their evolution as we see on the sky. And here we have something which is totally extravagant, no magnetic field old star but rotating in a crazy way and the explanation is that this is a quite advanced stage of evolution in low of low mass x-ray binaries and in this case the reason for fast rotation is the accretion the accretion contains a lot of angular momentum so finally if you it depose a lot of material with high angular momentum onto the neutron star, then the neutron star is rotating. And this uh, accreting neutron star, of course, irradiates the companion. So at the very, very end of the evolution, the companion can be totally evaporated. So we know uh, millisecond pulsars, which are really single pulsars. And uh, one of those uh, pulsars was actually named Black uh, Widow Pulsar because it consumed its companion, right? Like in this Black Widow <laughs> spiders. So for, for, for us in, in Poland, uh, those millisecond uh, pulsars are uh, additionally interesting because uh, Alexander Wolstein discovered the first extrasolar planet in just such a system around those planets were going around a millisecond pulsar with this name. So this discovery was uh, done in 1992. Uh, additionally, millisecond pulsars sometimes end their evolution uh, with the companion surviving and in the form of an, another neutron star. So then we have two neutron star system quite compact and then effects of GR are quite strong. So those, and then there is not that much wind or anything which, which would perturb the observations. So studying those systems really provide very good tests for, uh, of, of general relativity. So those are very, very useful uh, systems. Of course, we cannot uh, resolve those systems in the sense of, of, of seeing uh, in, like we had on this on, on, on the previous image that we see the, the accretion <laughs> this, whatever. 
that uh, Chandra, for example, what, what Chandra can do, this is the, 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 the red and the pink thing, show some kind of uh, jet-like uh, emission and some kind of uh, signature of probably evaporation of the, of the companion. So this is a superposition of the optical image and uh, uh, X-ray Chandra image. So this is the argument that the companion is, is slowly evaporated and we see a stream of, like in the comet tail, right? So this uh, discovery of, of extrasolar planet by Alex Wolstein and uh, uh, his uh, collaborator Dave Frail was, was done uh, three years before the, uh, before the discovery of extrasolar planets around uh, solar type stars and those the guys Mayor and Kellogg state they got the Nobel Prize this year for the discovery of extrasolar planets around solar type star. For, for the actual discovery of the first extrasolar planet, there was no uh, Nobel Prize award. <clears throat> and the reason is uh, this. This is, a, we know, uh, for, for extrasolar planets around uh, solar type stars, we know about 4,000 such systems, right? They are well studied, well known, and nobody has any, any doubts about their existence. On the other hand, as for planetary systems around pulsars, this is the complete table. You have one source with three planets, this is of Alex Wolstein, with very accurate measurement of the, of the uh, planet mass, of orbital period, everything. And then three more with very inaccurate measurements. And that's it. And there are some people who say that because the planet detection in those systems is not direct, it's not through <coughs> radial velocities, but well, it's 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 through the motion of the of the pulsar. Some people say that you can have instabilities inside neutron stars due to superfluid behavior, whatever, which can give maybe a periodic signal. <coughs> the counter argument of Alex Wolstein is that he sees the interaction between the planets, but just marginal. So maybe in the future, if we have more systems, perhaps the, 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 the issue will become again uh, under discussion. And there is now a new uh, radio, uh, detector radio, uh, radio telescope, right? His uh, the discovery of Alex Wolstein was done using Arecibo, you need large uh, radio telescope. And now uh, Chinese uh, started to, 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 to operate uh, Radio, teles radio telescope, which is much larger than Arecibo. It has, Arecibo has, I think, 200 meters or whatever, and their uh, radio telescope fast has 500 meters. And they already detected several millisecond pulsars. So maybe we will have more planetary systems around millisecond pulsars in the future. The second question, of course, is how those millisecond, <coughs> how those planets could formed there? And this is another very difficult question. Maybe the, it was a kind of interception or what? Because form, formation scenario is, is rather difficult to, to imagine. 
And because of these difficulties, when there was a, a, a call for a name of, of, of the, of the uh, star, this millisecond pulse, <coughs> the winner for, for the name is Leech. And I understand this Leech is a figure from computer games or whatever, which is really bad character, awful, and occasionally may disappear. <laughs> so. Okay, and finally, we have one more interesting, uh, not a separate class, but uh, specific phenomenon in sources containing neutron stars, and those are X-ray bursters. So those X-ray bursters are sources which emit X-ray radiation, and then all of a sudden, in a matter of one second, this is the light curve, this is the time in seconds, in one second here, it's, this was quite long, but in five seconds, the luminosity rises by a factor of more or less 10 for a few seconds, and then it slowly goes down. So at the beginning, it was not clear what is happening, but if you look at power spectrum, and uh, soon after, few such uh, good power spectra were, were determined, you see here a clear periodicity. Such a clear periodicity is a signature of rotational period of a neutron star. So of course the phenomenon is only happening on a neutron star. So what it is? We know what it is. This is just a thermonuclear flash at the surface of a neutron star. So it is absolutely identical for the basic mechanism to a, a classical novel. On the other hand, classical novi takes much longer, right? So why such a huge difference between here, this, this eruption and a <coughs> classical novi. The mechanism is the same. We have the generate uh, star. In the case of, of novi, we have a white dwarf with the generate electrons. Here we have neutron star with the generate neutrons. And, and then hydrogen rich envelope and thermonuclear reactions when the uh, envelope is large enough, enough material uh, accumulated and thermonuclear reactions can, can start. <coughs> the reason for the difference in amplitudes and in time scales is really simple to explain. First of all, the different, uh, difference in, in time scales. Neutron star is much more compact. The radius of the neutron star is 10 kilometers. The radius of the white dwarf is 10,000 kilometers, roughly, I mean, order of magnitude. So if you calculate the Keplerian time scale, for example, which is equivalent to any dynamical time scale in the system, and we had equations for that, you see that you have uh, uh, this is, this is three orders of magnitude, but in time scales, you have 1.5 power. So then you have more than 10 to four difference in time scale, in rising time scale. Then for the extension, in the case of NOVA, you have classical NOVA, you have an ejection of the envelope. And then for years, you observe this ejection. Here you don't have an ejection, so it's just slight expansion. And this is also very easy to explain if you look at the uh, efficiency of different processes. As we talked, nuclear burning has this efficiency. 
a patient onto a wild dwarf has much lower efficiency. That also means that binding energy in the case of wild dwarf is small, so you can easily eject all the accumulated material away and you have ejection. In the case of neutron star, the accretion efficiency is much larger. So you cannot unbind the, the, the envelope. It expands a little from 10 kilometers, you can go to 100 kilometers at most. And then it collapses after those few seconds. And that's it, nothing else happens. So it's, and also energetically this is just a short addition to generally much, much higher luminosity in the system. So this, this is really well understood part. Uh, now we have another division, which is absolutely perpendicular or to the previous divisions. And this is according to the time depend time behavior of sources. And the obvious division is into persistent sources and transient sources. This division is observational and you have to remember that it's kind of observational but done uh, in the past. So in the past some so x-ray sources were all of a sudden visible and then they were undetected. And they were classified as transient sources, while those like Cygnus X1, which you can observe anytime you, you feel like observing it, you can observe it. The change in technology, of course, changed the situation. So now if you take this transient sources, and if you feel like observing them when they were not previously observed, you can do it. And this is named observation of the source in quiescent state. So now the division is not so obvious, but if in the past the classification was done, then the, we still use this uh, phrase persistent or transient, which somehow is related to the amplitude of the outburst, but then amplitudes are different in different out, outbursts. So the classification is not really well justified, but okay, it's used, right? So you have to know what it is. And well, persistent sources are persistent, nothing interesting, but transient sources again are divided into two, uh, groups, periodic sources and X-ray novae. So periodic sources are basically always belonging to high mass X-ray binaries. So sometimes those, di those divisions are not uh, absolutely uh, mm, and related, although done at the basis of different uh, properties. Uh, high mass X ray binaries uh, quite frequently have highly eccentric orbits. Those are young systems. So if you have uh, here this not very elegant uh, drawing of mine, I didn't find anything in the internet. If you have a, a, a star with a strong wind and then a compact object on elliptical orbit, then if the compact object is far from the wind, then you do not have really much of the accretion. On the other hand, at uh, periastron, you go into the dense wind of the star and your accretion becomes really intense. But because this is due to the orbit uh, or uh, orbital uh, motion, then those outbursts uh, repeat precisely again and again and again because orbital period is really well measured. Outbursts themselves are not always identical because winds of stars are not as regular as we sometimes may say. 
but the, the orbital period is, is well uh, seen. So, for example, uh, here you have uh, one of the, of the uh, sources, the, the, the light curve, uh, here is uh, RXT, and this is a swift light curve, another satellite. This is really, uh, the light curve started in 1996, finished at 2016. So you see, in this case, outbursts are not very uh, frequent, but they are strong and, and quite short in comparison with separation. And then you have some activity between outbursts, so probably some accreting material form, the temporary disk or what, but the outburst is clearly uh, seen. Whether the accretion disk forms or, or, or not, it's, it's difficult to say because this is very complicated phenomenon. So most people who, who model accretion disk, they still stay, stay far from those systems because those are just too, too difficult to to, to model. So this, uh, and in this ca case, also there are uh, sometimes uh, suggestions that when the source is, is uh, far away, it has this uh, remnant accretion disk, but then it uh, goes into uh, this propeller state, this ejection state. In, in this particular source, the, this, this people, I, I'm not sure how to pronounce this name. Shamoti? I'm sorry to the author. Anyway, they, they did observations in, uh, in quiescence. sense of the source. As I told you, now we can see sources in quiescence. And what they saw is actually a black body temperature of the temperature five times 10 to six Kelvin. This is typical one or one KV. This is the typical temperature of the neutron star. Nothing extra than that. But did they measure the spin up and spin down? Because in the propeller regime, you would expect- the No, they cannot measure. Uh -huh. You know, quiescence is really low uh, signal. They were able to, to integrate only and to measure the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And integration was pretty long, so I don't think that they, they, they couldn't measure the, the, the spin itself. On the other hand, the emitting area <laughs> looked like uh, 0.203 kilometer radius, much less than 10 kilometers, which you would expect for a neutron star. So they argue that what we see then is just accretion column, right? Because in that case, you have an accretion from only a small fraction of a neutron star. But they argue that this is not really a, a propeller state, just a weak accretion column. I think it's very interesting, but they cannot do better. Maybe with other sorts, I don't know. The luminosity then is, is very faint. It looks like, like a cataclysmic variable, actually. So now let's go to, to X-ray novi. And this is really something which is uh, extremely important uh, to uh, understand the behavior of accretion disks. I think they are better laboratories than, than cataclysmic variables, but okay, it's a matter of taste. Anyway, what is an X-ray nova? Sometimes they are also called uh, soft X-ray transients but I think X-ray nova is now more popular name for those sources. This is really something spectacular. This is a very old uh, observation of uh, Nova Musca, one of the, of the most famous uh, sources of, observed in 1991. It was not detected first, 
but you know it became brighter by two more than two orders of magnitude in a matter of a day or so and then it slowly decayed over two three hundred days observations were done by by Ginga, by, by japanese uh, satellite so the rise time is like a day or a few days, very, very fast. On the other hand, the decay time is really very long. So the rise time suggested that it's a similar thing like in cataclysmic variables, like in dwarf novi, right? Few days rise time. On the other hand, in cataclysmic variables, you have a few that you have the decay time, which is also a few days. It's almost symmetric. The outburst is symmetric. But here, the outburst is much, much longer. And of course, the total uh, energy participated in this process is also much larger because here during the outburst we reach uh, luminosities of order of 10 to 38 ergs per second while in cataclysmic variables we have energies of the order of 10 to 33 ergs per second but this is related uh, to the accretion efficiency otherwise those systems are very similar because the binary system is the same. You have low mass main sequence donor star. You have an accretion through L1. You have similar periods, like a couple of days. So the size of the disk, which is important for ionization stability, is the same. The only difference is that instead of large white dwarf, you have small compact neutrons oh, compact black hole. Sources with neutron star never show this kind of outcomes. So then effi accretion efficiency is much, much higher. So there is actually one very exceptional source in this family. Because I said uh, that this dwarf nova last few hundred days let's say usually, although we will look at it at more, but one source, and this is actually the most famous source, GRS 1915 plus 105, that went into outburst in 1992. It was undetected before, it went into outburst, and it's still, still there, it's still active, And the prediction, theoretical prediction based on ionization instability is that uh, it will be, remain active for the next 20 or maybe even 100 years. Why is that? Here is a very nice picture made actually by, by Orosh in one of his publications, but then reproduced by many people. So I, I took it from a review uh, uh, by McClintock and Narayan. But the drawing is made exactly of all binaries in proportions, without any cheating, as according to our knowledge. And you see that GRS 1915 is much larger than any of the other systems, right? They are tiny in comparison. This is huge and it has very long orbital period. And during the outburst, the outer part of the disk is strongly irradiated. So then the uh, unstable part of the disk becomes much larger than for unirradiated disk. Irradiation is strong. So you have huge accretion disk, which is now unstable and in the outburst. And if it is just 
as large as, as, as you can see, the time scale is as, as long as you can estimate easily. So we can enjoy this, this source for, for many, many years to, to come. In other cases, uh, the <coughs> system is, is much more compact. Here for comparison, you have uh, Signal 6 one more compact, although this uh, star is uh, O-type uh, star. And also pay attention to the fact that here the accretion disk is much smaller than the separation between the stars. And this is also not, not an accident. This is characteristic for focused wind accretion, the disk is smaller. Here you, you see the disk is quite large in comparison with separation. Everything is done really in proportion. And this is the distance between the sun and Mercury too that your imagination. And by the way, the, the next outburst of the, of the system is predicted to, to happen in 10,000 years. So maybe there are more such systems, we just don't, don't see them. So why, why this outburst lasts so long? I told you that this was immediately interpreted as the result of the irradiation, because you have strong now source of the emission in the innermost parts. And then the irradiated hot part is much larger than initially you could estimate, and it would be estimated in cataclysmic variables. In cataclysmic variables, the, irradiation by the central part is practically negligible or at least orders of magnitude lower than, than, than here. So irradiation well explains the previous, uh, I will go, uh -huh. I wanted to go back. So irradiation well explains this long lasting outburst. And there were theoretical models of this, but as usually, no, nothing is as simple as, as you would like to have, because this radiation should be always present, right? On the other hand, there are some outbursts, and for, for the whole collection of, of uh, shapes, you can look into this uh, oldish paper, and some outbursts here you see 20 days, almost symmetry, outburst and the decay. And here it's just a few days, outburst and a decay. And this is also classified as X-ray novi. So if you look into this paper, only very few X-ray novi have those huge outbursts. Most of them are more symmetry. So then, uh, People who study irradiation, they try to count on the irradiation effect. And this is from the paper by Tetarenko et al. 2018. They calculated the outburst. This is theoretical, uh, a simple theoretical model with irradiation effect, but also without any wind. So then the outburst lasts for uh, over 100 days. And then apart from the irradiation, they introduced wind. Of course, wind takes away the energy. So it reduces the unstable zone. So when they introduce the wind, they can make shorter lasting outburst. On the other hand, they cannot do anything which is exactly symmetric, right? This would be really a strange cons conspiracy between two effects to make them cancelling. So I don't know, maybe the, the radiation is not always uh, as strong as, as we think. It's just one of, of, of the good questions.
one more typical problem which we have in X-ray binaries. We are lucky not to have it in AGNs. It's hard to tell a black hole from a neutron star. This is always a good uh, question. The most basic uh, method is the mass measurement because we know from the equation of state that a neutron star cannot have a mass much larger than two <coughs> solar masses. The exact limit is not so simple to, to estimate. It depends on the equation of state, um, on the rotation of the star, on whether fast, of course, fast, ro fast rotation increases the mass, then on the type of rotation, if you have a rigid rotation or differential rotation, I'm not sure if differential rotation is better. I think it's rigid rotation is better. I'm not sure if, if you have questions, ask the group of Pavel Hensel, Michal Bege, Leszek Zdurnik, et cetera. They will know for sure they are experts in this field. So we should determine the, the mass of the central uh, object. And if it is much larger than three solar masses, that's the usual Fermi limit, then it's a black hole. The problem is that if you measure the orbital motion from emission lines, whatever, from the op op optical uh, observations, then you can, then you measure the period, which is simple. Then you measure usually the, the, the amplitude of the radial velocity. And that unfortunately gives you only the mass function not the mass of the central source, because then the companion mass is also in this formula, but most importantly, the viewing angle is important, right? Because if you have a top view, you will have no Doppler broadening of your lines. And that is really a, a, a difficult task because you have to estimate this viewing angle. Estimating the mass of the companion is easier usually from the spectral type, you can roughly estimate what's, what the mass is. But the viewing angle can be quite uh, tricky. So it's not quite simple. I didn't find the most recent <coughs> table for uh, black hole mass uh, estimates, but uh, I think that the errors are still quite uh, representative of some of the systems. This is taken from, from some review paper of, of Janusz Zhukowski. So in, 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 this, in some systems, like this one, for example, you measure the, the mass function, which is already six solar masses. And the mass function gives actually the, the lower limit for the mass. So then the, the black hole nature of the system is, is immediately obvious. Whatever you do with viewing angle, it can only increase this mass. On the other extreme, for example, you have this famous and unfortunate signal X1, where the mass function is only a small fraction of a solar mass. And then everything relies on estimates of the viewing angle and this is not an eclipsing source. If you have an eclipsing source, you have nice estimate of the viewing angle. If you don't have an eclipsing source, you have to, to work with the departure of the companion from spherical symmetry. And that's, that's kind of tricky. I think maybe the present uh, estimates of signal six one mass is, is a bit more accurate, but I, I, I wouldn't be sure if it is much more accurate. Um, I read one uh, from yes. Orosh. If I'm not wrong, it's like 2015 and it's more or less it's like 14 solar masses, but I don't remember the error, I believe. And how did they measure this SS433? Because there is no mass function here. Did they from radial velocity? No, there is no mass function, I think, for S. In, in SS433, we do not see the companion. <coughs> yeah, because this one is very strange. It has like an 
it's a side view, yeah. it's microquasar, maybe yes, a neutron yeah, star yeah. system. I think we don't see the companion there for some reason. I'm not sure, it was really very famous some, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, and people thought that it, it will solve all the problems. Actually, it rather contributed to all the problems instead of solving them. For me, the most puzzling property of this source is that we, we see the system side on, we see a jet in the system. This is not a relativistic jet. But it has the velocity of 0.28, if I remember correctly, of the light speed. Quite fast. And still, we see iron emission line from the jet. How you can have relativistic speed and still not ionize iron? And somehow you can. Somehow you can. You, you, you see that in the data, you see periodic uh, motion because in this system the precession is strong. <clears throat> yeah, because in the literature I was saying that this source is like an offset equivalence, like it's, it has the same <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's possible, yeah. So masses more or less are 8 to 10 solar masses. And they seem to be somewhat different from what we now know from gravitational waves. This is uh, the mass. So here we have neutron stars. Most of them are below two solar masses. One is a bit extravagantly above. Here we have uh, mass estimates from X-ray binaries. And then this light blue is the detection of uh, black holes in this merging binaries in LIGO, Virgo. They are much higher. But, well, we don't know whether the population is different or it's just a selection bias, right? Because if you have larger mass, then of course the detection of the event is much easier. Then those systems are detected at large distances, while those systems are in our galaxy or sort of nearby. This is high metallicity environment, while those may come from low metallicity environment where stars evolve in different way and then uh, black hole masses uh, formed uh, with uh, systematically higher masses. Probably it's not a, a large problem, I mean, but for, for future studies. Uh, then there are other methods to uh, distinguish. So uh, detection of the, of the rotational period of a neutron star or detection of the X-ray burst. This is a firm confirmation that we have a neutron star. As simple as that. For example, I think Circinus X1 was considered to be a black hole candidate for a couple of years, and then it just showed type 1 burst, and that was, that was it. It's a neutron star, no, no question. The remaining methods are not quite uh, reliable, but I would like to, to, to show you uh, an exemplary case with a neutron star when we know we have a neutron star. So in the case of black hole, I showed this figure already a couple of times, I guess. We have the different spectral states. Sometimes we have very high state or ultra soft state. This is the most extreme thing. And then in the low hard state, we have a kind of power low emission. So here we have a disk emission and this is just a power low, no, no disk. In the case of sources with neutron star, we have two broad components. Some people quarrel which component is black body and which component is thermalization. But I think uh, uh, it's a reasonable thing to assume that this is a black body component and this is 
optimized components. Those systems consist of uh, neutron star, but apart from the neutron star and the disk, we have this boundary layer. So we have, uh, I told you that in the case of, of boundary layer, half of the uh, half of an energy is dissipated in the boundary layer, half in the disk, or actually if you take GR into account, you will have two times more energy in, in the boundary layer. So both the emission from the neutron star itself and from the disk, multicolor disk, and then from, from the boundary layer is all kind of mixed up. And the boundary layer is probably puffed up a bit, so then strong Comptonization takes place there. So the, the, the theory of, of those spectra is, is not really well developed. Usually just people use some known elements like single black body, multicolor black body, Comptity, which goes for, for Comptonization. And how it works, who knows? Well, So if you see this kind of spectrum, it looks different from that. So you can also suggest that this is a neutron star almost, just look from looking at it. On the other hand, if you do the search of, of the binary systems, and then again, you plot them on color, color diagram, you see the problem. So here, I think the, uh, Oh, oh, open circles are for black holes and color things are for neutron stars. <laughs> you see, sometimes uh, black holes are quite separate from uh, neutron stars, but sometimes they do overlap. So then you cannot tell at the basis of the spectrum. Then sometimes people discuss the emission level in quiescence, that uh, in, if you correlate the emission in quiescence with the orbital period of the binary, black holes here, red uh, dots, are always below the um, neutron star sources. And the standard argument is that uh, uh, we have uh, no fear layer, no, no firm surface in the case of, of a black hole. And this is a black hole, but uh, uh, in the case of neutron star, you have the same accretion rate, but here you dissipate more energy and here you have inner ADAP and you do not dissipate. On the other hand, it's not obvious whether you have the same uh, situation you can have for example a situation that you you have uh, no accretion in both cases anyway it's and then, then the emission here may come from technonuclear reactions and then the amplitude of outbursts i don't think it's really reliable then from power spectra there are there were suggestions that if you study the power spectrum, I told you about the power spectrum when we talked about variability. If you compare the power spectrum of signal sex one as a function of frequency, you see that it finishes much earlier than the power spectrum of the neutron star source. And then the obvious explanation was that here, the mass of the central object is one order of magnitude lower because neutron star has one solar mass and Cygnus X1 has 10 solar mass. But it's not quite working uh, because, for example, this, this uh, pink or magenta, this is a neutron star source and it finishes more or less at the same place. So it's not working. Well, uh, one Regularities that neutron star sources, they have more frequently this kind of QPO peaks. While in, in uh, black hole systems, those QPO uh, events are, are much less uh, frequent and more difficult to detect. 
So now spectral states of galactic black holes, we talked about it. So I'm still using a, a plot which I, I showed before. I think all those transition states are related to the fact that we have some kind of hot flow and coronal flow and jet, but then in some states the disk becomes dominating and uh, approaches this in this ISCO in their most stable circular orbit and sometimes it recedes and then it's not really uh, visible in X-ray uh, band. So in the spectra, in X-ray spectra, when, when the disk is distant, you see only the, the emission from the hot flow and then it has a shape of the power law. But in uh, one case of X-ray NOVA, which is really very, very nearby, you can actually see that the disk is still there. This is what you normally would see in X-rays, but because the, the, the absorption column to this source is, is low and it's a nearby source, then you see also everything in, in soft, very soft X-rays and UV, and you still see the disk at a distance of uh, some 70 uh, gravitational radii. So the disk is there, only it went away. So the, the classification is frequently still done like this, very high state, high soft state, intermediate state, low hard state, and quiet cells. And those states are quite uh, luminous. This is the uh, ratio of the luminosity to the Eddington luminosity. In those states, we have a disk. And then the position of the inner radius is more or less consistent with ISCO in those states. And then we do not see the disk in, in, in quiet sense, that, that's for sure. And then the contribution of the, of the power law is kind of a fraction, like 20%. And it's similar in very high state and in intermediate state. And for many years, people discussed what's the difference between intermediate state and very high state. And of course, it's quite clear if you, if you look at this uh, turtle diagram. Here I show you a version of the picture similar to the picture I, I showed already, which shows really the evolution of the X-ray nova. So here is the outburst of the X-ray nova. One outburst, one spectacular outburst, then another outburst not so spectacular. And when you plot the whole evolution, here you have the luminosity and here have hardness ratio, you see three loops. So it does not always went through all the loop, but let's say here it went through all the loop. So you start with the hard state and then you go to soft states and then you drop the luminosity and then the source returns again to, to where it started, to the quiet sense. So of course this is hard state, this is soft state, and this is very high state and this is intermediate state. And they are spectrally similar because they have the same hardness, right? So by definition, they are similar, but they are widely different in, in luminosity because the source in different part of this, of this loop. So when, when you use this cla classification, it's actually better always to, to locate the source on, on this kind of, of, of diagram. And what is also important, uh, here you see a significant uh, hysteresis effect. And this is not yet modeled. Everything is not yet modeled. His by hysteresis, I mean, when you look here, here you have uh, the same uh, time evolution, but here the color is the same as here. So you go up with luminosity, being still in the hard state, then you go to the soft state, but then the next transition happens not here, but it happens here. 
a much lower flux. And this is the hysteresis. This is what we call the hysteresis, that the transition from hard to soft happens at higher luminosity than the transition from soft to hard. This is observational uh, fact. Sources which are persistent, like Signal 6 one they do not show this kind of hysteresis. They show some transition states, most frequently failed state. They, Signal 6 one goes occasionally to soft state, but not that frequently, but never shows the hysteresis. On the other hand, if you perform the whole loop of the X-ray nova, you do see the hysteresis. So it should tell us something about the, how the operation proceeds. The problem is that we don't have models which theoretically explain how this happens and why this happens. We have models which can reproduce the data. This is not the same. So it's usually accepted, and here is one more recent paper that indeed the, the, the disk is truncated when we have a, a low heart state because we don't see the disk in, in quiescent state. It has to be, but some people still discuss this issue for uh, unknown reasons. Uh, on the other hand, hard uh, right state is, is, is quite difficult. Very high state, warm corona, whatever. This is still difficult. So there are models. Here is one of those models. Uh, it was uh, developed by Ferreira at all, but it was used to, to feed the data by Marcel et al. this year. This model looks in the following uh, way. It contains a, a cold disk, a hot uh, flow, so it has some kind of transition from cold disk to ADAP, but then it also has additional jet-related uh, part of accretion, which is still different from, from hot uh, ADAP. So this is another transition radius. And here they form an outflow. So this is a non-relativistic jet. And in this uh, part, this jet takes all the angular momentum. And the accretion here is supersonic. This is due to the strong magnetic field postulated in this model. I still do not understand how this model works in, in, in detail because highly supersonic flow may have problems to transport things out, but I don't want to enter into this problem now. So such models have a number of parameters, uh, like one, the, one the transition from cold disk to ADA, from this ADA to this part, and then there is some kind of hand waving behind it, and some spectra computations, but you cannot predict the positions of, in this model. You cannot predict this position as a function of accretion rate. You fit independently accretion rate, positions of transitions, everything like that. But in that case, yes, indeed, you can reproduce the evolution, so you then can reproduce even the, 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 the radio emission, the position of those things. You would like to have theoretical model, but we are still quite far from that. So maybe some of you are working in this field and developing a model, and then we will have another. But this is really new data fitting. This is not yet a model. So the summary. There were a few things which are well explained, like X-ray bursters. But there is much longer list of things which are not well explained. Some of them I discussed some of them I even didn't discuss this time. Source statistics, global evolution, this common envelope, hibernation periods, maybe 
this is still under discussion. This prop propeller stage, I think this is a good question mark, as I said. QPO, I didn't talk much about QPO, but they, are the, for example, Marek Abramowicz and Wody Kluzniak from this institute explained QPO as uh, uh, frequencies related to Keplerian motion. The problem is that we see QPO in hot flow and not in the cold flow, never ever in the cold flow. So we still don't know what it is. Maybe it's a hot torus precession, maybe the, because QPOs are mostly seen in transition state. So the state is not well specified. As I said, exact physics of, of state transitions. We have only parametric description. We should have this evaporation. We have, should have this formation of hot flow, coronal flow, etc. We don't have it really because of, we don't have the, the behavior of the magnetic field, right? This is where we are stuck. Jet formation, jet power, of course. As I said before, during and of course, we have also here winds and outflows. So a lot of things to do. What is maybe interesting is that things actually repeat. So they are kind of common for many accreting systems. The same thing will be in AGN. Part of those things were actually in cataclysmic variables. So it's a universal problem with which we are kind of stuck. Okay, and this is a suggestion for the homework. Questions? There was some discussion in the meantime. Comments? They went already asleep, I guess. <laughs> I mean, remote. So one comment I can make about the existence of magnetars in binary systems. It is that the, the lifetime of a magnetar is around 10 to the power 5 years as compared to other neutron stars. Where if you want to see a, like a neutron star, it's 10 to the power 8 years. So one is very unlikely to see a magnetar in a binary system. Mm -hmm. Because it's a short, really yeah. short period in comparison with... Yeah. <coughs> Okay, more comments because you, some of you are probably experts in this field. No, okay, you won't rest. <laughs> <laughs>